Hey family, I'm PT, Pastor Torrey Roberts. I'm the lead pastor of the Potter's House at 1 LA in Denver. And on behalf of my wife, Pastor Sarah and myself, we want to welcome you to our channel and to this word. I cannot wait for you to hear what God has for you in this message. I want to tell you a few things really quickly. Subscribe. If you're not already subscribed to this channel, subscribe so that you can be made aware of all of the word that's coming at you week in and week out, and also turn on your notifications so you don't miss a morsel that comes forth. We're also grateful for you and your partnership. If you are so uh, compelled, we invite you to support what we're doing, not just our church, but what our church is doing. There are a number of outreaches, a number of things, critical, necessary things that we support, and we're able to do it because of your generosity. So without further ado, let's get right into this word. God bless you. I'll see you soon. Hallelujah. Isn't it a wonderful thing to worship God, to celebrate God, our King, our hope, our Redeemer. He is our everything. And, and I'm excited about today. I believe that today is a special day. And, and I'm starting a new series today called Modern Church. You said, Pastor, two years ago, you did a series called Modern Church. Yes, I did. This is Modern Church, the next dimension. And I believe that this is an important message. Think about it. Has there ever been a greater time in history than now to rethink church, to reimagine church? In fact, here is the reality. Over the past year and a half, we've had to do that. I was talking to a gentleman that I know at One Day LA, an event that we did last weekend, a powerful kingdom event. I'll reference it later in, in our conversation, but I was talking to a gentleman and and I hadn't seen him since before the pandemic. And, and, uh, and you know, when the pandemic happened, everybody had this term pivot, you know, we, we had to pivot. And, and you, you almost took the credit for, I, I, I successfully pivoted. But here is the reality, you, you didn't pivot, God moved. God shifted and you and I decided that it was a wise thing to try to figure out what God was doing now. God allowed his church to be shaken so that that which could not be shaken could remain. And so all that has been taking place is to get us to a place over these past year and a half to rethink the kingdom, to rethink church. What is modern church? Let me just uh, disqualify some false ideas about what, what I mean when I say modern church. When I say modern church, I'm not talking about new church. It's really more like retro church. I ride motorcycles, as you, as you may or may not know, and, and one of my motorcycles is a, a Triumph, and it's called a Thruxton RS, and it's a, it's a cafe racer. It's called a cafe racer, and, and the cafe racer style motorcycles were very popular in the 1960s, you know, the, the look of them. And so mine is not a 1960, you gotta be reliable in Jesus' name. You know, it, it's, it's new, but it has that same style and that same look. The essence of it is the same, but it's been updated so that it is compliant with the times and has success, accessories and, and, uh, and accommodations that make it relevant to now. Same essence. It's still a cafe racer, but it's relevant for today. Jesus, watch this. We, we look at Jesus and we think Jesus sandals and old school, and we look at Jesus and we think ancient. But when Jesus stepped on the scene, he was the new thing, baby. He was fresh. He was modern. They couldn't figure him out. They were all, you know, talking old, old Testament language. And Jesus was like, the kingdom of heaven is like. And he took ancient stories and made them contemporary for those who were listening so that they can understand what the kingdom was. Because if he came and he tried to introduce it in, in an old way, the generation that was alive would not understand it. Jesus was modern. And he almost, well, I was gonna say, he almost got killed for it. <laughs> yeah, he got killed because he was modern. Modern is the way of God. So when I say modern, I'm not talking about, because somebody said, well, didn't they say Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, forevermore? Yes, the same essence, different expression, because the expression has to do with the generation that is alive. Your stories, my stories, the things that I move by, sometimes my kids are like, what? 
the shows that I watched, sometimes the kids are like, what? You know, and my parents watch stuff and I'm like, huh? Or they say things, you know, groovy. You don't say groovy no more. We try to, you know, we try to bring some terms back or whatever. Y'all don't say groovy, groovy, man. Y'all don't say that. Y'all say other stuff, but the meaning is the same. And so when I say modern church, I'm talking about, watch this, a church that is current. I remember this guy uh, commented, uh, and we're going to pray in just a minute, and, and we're going to get into this message, but I remember a guy, uh, he commented, he said, man, man, you are a 21st century pastor. And I'm like, aren't we in the 21st century? It, it was almost like his expectation of me was to be outdated. And an outdated church can't have impact in modern times. And so a modern church, a modern church is a current church. And I like that word current, right? Because a current also is a flow. Current is a flow, right? And so, so a modern church is a church that flows. God is a flow. Peace that flows like a river. River out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. God is not a puddle. The kingdom is not a puddle. The kingdom is a flow. And, and those who will be modern and updated and current in the kingdom will have to know how to flow. And if the church ever becomes a puddle, then God will shake it up and say, you missed it. And how does a church become a puddle? I, I'm not supposed to be preaching yet. How does a church become a puddle? A church becomes a puddle when he or she disconnects, watch this, from the flow that established it in the first place. And an individual becomes a puddle when they disconnect from the flow that got them saved and then begin to believe that it's all about the building or the title or the ministry and not the mission connect it to the flow. Are you tracking with me? All of us are saved because somebody got, was connected to the mission. None of us got saved to sit in church. None of us got saved. In fact, the church was just the place where it happened, <laughs> but it wasn't even the purpose for it happening. It was the place. So we're going to talk about it today. I just wanted to clear that up. I'm not talking about new things. All the religious people say, oh, what is, no, I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about us being a movement, us being current, us being in a flow. And we're going to get into it right now. I want to draw your attention to Acts, the 10th chapter and the 38th verse. This is going to be our anchor passage of scripture for this first week in our new series, Modern Church. And I believe it's going to bless you. It says... How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be in the midst of your sons and daughters and to share this word, God. Hallelujah. It is a wonderful thing, God, to rethink church. What a time to do it. To consider what you may be doing and how you may be doing it. A time to search the scriptures so that we might be aligned with who you are, that we might follow your pattern. For if we do it your way, we will be successful and glorious and victorious. So, Father, I thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and insight and knowledge and prophecy and, and full use of all the gifts of the Holy Spirit that, that this message might come out with clarity and practicality. Hallelujah. And I thank you for those who are under the sound of my voice, God, that this message might bring about an activation in their hearts and their minds that all of us might be to the next level, all and even more closely resembling who you created us to be. We love you. We thank you. Have your way, sweet Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's, let's get into this. Thank you, Jesus. Um, you know, a few months back, I had a 
uh, one of you know the sons of our church had a bad experience with a, with a doctor, a doctor visit. And, uh, and quite frankly, the doctor, uh, as he went in there to, uh, to get or to evaluate whether or not he needed surgery, the doctor made some really uh, what could be considered racially insensitive remarks to him. Uh, they weren't slurs or anything like that, but they were, it was racially insensitive. Uh, the, the, you know, and you know, quite frankly, he may not have even meant to do it. You know, sometimes there's an ignorance. I'm not making excuses for them. I'm just saying that the long and the short of it was this young man was hurt uh, and offended, and he called me. He wanted to know what to do. And, uh, and so I talked to him, and I heard him out, and, uh, and I gave him my, my practical instructions. But, but all, you know, at the end of the day, I also called my attorney as well um, to get counsel about, you know, is there some sort of recourse that this young man would have? And, uh, and in that conversation with my attorney, he said, well, doctors have uh, an oath that they must take. And depending on the medical school, the, the, the oath varies. It's determined by the medical school. So some medical schools have one oath. Another would have you know, a, 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 a different type of oath. But uh, there is one really common oath that doctors take. Uh, and it is the... Uh, from a Greek physician, an ancient Greek physician uh, named Hippocrates. And, uh, and his, uh, part of his quote in, uh, is, uh, and it's this Latin phrase, so I'm gonna try to say it, and if I mess it up, I'm not Latin, clearly, you know. Well, not clearly, I could be, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm English. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. And so uh, this, this, this quote that is associated with this oath that these doctors must take is uh, the Latin phrase primum non nonsere, nonsere, sorry, primum non nonsere. And it literally means first do no harm. First do no harm. So as a doctor, many take this particular oath and this oath literally, their hand up, swear, as a doctor, as a, as a servant, as one who's called to perform this, my first order of duty for those who subscribe to this oath is to do no harm. And um, I thought that was profound. I never knew that. That even doctors consider their, uh, their profession, their career, and their skill set service. And the, and the oath that many of them take is that first and foremost, I'm not going to do any harm. And I was thinking about this passage where it talks about how God had anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. And certainly, Jesus didn't do any harm, but he says he went about doing good. And when we take a step back and we start looking at the church, it is obvious that we're not supposed to be doing harm, you know? And I think that if I might just, before I really get into this message, I think that it is important if we're going to be the modern retro church that we subscribe to the same oath, that, that the church is anointed to do good. We're going to unpack that wonderfully in just a minute. And so if we ever find ourselves doing harm to any people, to any community, to, to any uh, disenfranchised group in society, then we have missed God entirely. And not only, not only are we not supposed to do harm, but the Bible says, Jesus said, what it says of Jesus is that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about actually doing good. What's crazy about that is because him doing good is showing up before it talks about him doing miracles. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about first and foremost doing good. Now, I want to unpack that doing good because if you study that word, if you look up that word that was translated doing good, it literally means philanthropy. Talking about the modern church, let's look at it closely. Philanthropy. Philanthropy, broken down, you know this from two words, philos, which is love, anthropos, which has to do with humanity. So it is the love of humanity, right, to do good. This is what Jesus was known for. This is what he did. And I heard someone describe philanthropy 
in an interesting way recently, and he broke down the difference between charity and philanthropy. And he says the difference between charity and philanthropy (laughs) is that charity focuses on eliminating the suffering that is caused by social problems, while philanthropy focuses on eliminating the social problem. Charity doesn't deal with the problem. It only deals with the problem to the extent of helping to ease and to manage the suffering. But philanthropy gets in there and says, I want to get to the root. I want to eliminate the problem altogether. And then I said, oh, my God. As this passage started opening itself up to me, I had to go back and read it again. Because because it says how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power and he went out doing good. So that means that there is, watch this, an anointing on the church to solve problems. Oh, you got to catch what I'm saying. It's not just doing good, you know, and feeding, and that's wonderful. We can do all that too. But no, no, no. There is a there is a philanthropic anointing on the church that allows the church to solve societal problems. <laughs> See, I thought, and you thought, we thought that the anointing was simply for preaching. Oh, glory! I feel the Lord. We, we thought that the anointing was for simply laying hands on the sick and watching them be healed. We, we thought that the anointing was only for driving out devils, raising the dead. But as I am rethinking church and I'm looking at the perfect model of the expression of God in the kingdom, I'm seeing Jesus, and the Bible says that he was anointed to be philanthropic to solve problems supernaturally. As many of you know, I've, I've, I, was in a, I was on the board of, of an, a major citywide, region-wide outreach called One Day LA. And Google them and look look them up. But one of the things that I really, really was blown away by was how the Lord had given to the leadership team wisdom on how to solve problems that the county of L.A. and the city of L.A. and state and local officials had not been able to solve. One of the areas that we, we, we moved in was in the foster care system. Backlog, backed up, and studies show that a lot of the dysfunction that shows up in the world today can be traced back to fatherlessness or can be traced back to the things that have been broken down in the family can be traced down literally, specifically, to the foster care system. Isn't that something? And so we begin to to work with these organizations and begin to leverage our wisdom and insight and relationships to now decrease the caseload. And so so these foster children, many of which where it would have been, you know, 200 don't have a place, we're reducing those numbers down, finding them homes, solutions, solving problems. And one of the things that this pandemic has done is this pandemic has introduced, come on, modern church, has introduced modern problems. One of the problems that the pandemic has introduced is debt and a specific type of debt, medical debt, because they got sick. You didn't plan on getting sick. You were saving for your house. You were saving for your car. You were saving for college. You didn't have no savings. Who right now has a savings for? If I get sick, I got $40,000 over here just in case I get sick. And the average person doesn't have that. So now, not only have you not been able to work and lost your job in many cases, not been able to do your, your business in many cases because you got sick, but now you got a bill. Now you're in debt. And through our organization, we were able to raise... Watch this, over $20 million to eradicate debt, solving a problem 
that not even welfare could solve. Let me tell you something about the Holy Spirit. Let's run over to Isaiah chapter 11. I just want to read verse 2. This is interesting because we think the Holy Spirit, but I want us to understand what we got when we got the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 11 and 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord, and it's speaking of Jesus when he would come. This is a prophecy of Jesus. It says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. In other words, there's more to the spirit than you think. Just give me one of those things and I'm good. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge. (sighs) I'm getting excited right now. Knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord, the deep reverence of the Lord that postures you in a way where he reveals his secrets to you. Psalm 25, 14. Are you tracking with me? So, so in all that, you don't think that there's an anointing to solve problems? <laughs> in the spirit of wisdom and revelation and counsel and might and knowledge, you don't think that in what God has anointed us for, there lacks the ability to figure, watch this, anything out? There's a passage of scripture, it's in Deuteronomy 4 and 6, or 6 and 4, study it when you get a chance, it's powerful. It's when Moses is giving instruction to the children of Israel, and he says something brilliant and profound. He says, these things I'm teaching you, now he was teaching from the Torah, we know that on Pentecost, the Torah became spirit, even as it was prophesied that the law, Jeremiah 33, 33, somewhere, or 37, 37, somewhere, read the whole Bible, it's in there, but Jeremiah prophesied and said, the law right now that you're reading is going to be in your hearts and your mind. So the Torah, when, when Moses was teaching them the Torah and he was saying, keep these things, he said, for this will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all the peoples. So wisdom elevates you. Your ability to solve problems problems elevate you. We got the attention of so many people because who is this crazy radical bunch anointed to solve these problems that we have been trying to solve, making us look good? And now next thing you know, we're at the SoFi Stadium with tens, a brand new stadium, by the way. I mean, 10 things haven't happened there yet. I don't even think five things have happened there yet. And now all of a sudden, here we are, the church, with this incredible platform, giving God the glory, and thousands of people give their lives to the Lord. So what created that platform? (laughs) Philanthropy. Solving problems. Watch this. The missed outreach tool. The missed Kingdom strategy is philanthropy. Because what I have learned is philanthropy opens the door. (laughs) See, you think that when you're doing good for somebody, that, you know, that that doesn't mean anything. I'm going to have to steal, try to find a way to get them. No, 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 no. It's the beginning. If you look at Jesus' ministry, the beginning of the healing, the beginning of the work, the beginning of come and follow me, the beginning of of the disciples, men and women following Jesus, the beginning of that was a touch, was a problem solved. And so we think solving problems is less spiritual (laughs) than casting out a devil. No, sometimes you can't even get the platform or the, the platform in a person's life to cast the devil out until you solve a problem. That's, right. That's why the Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. Get it. Get it. Not just for you. Your wisdom and your ability to I feel the Lord to solve a problem is going to give you influence. How did Jesus get influence? He, God had anointed him and he went about solving problems. That's why many business people and business leaders are called to the kingdom. If you think about 
the people that Jesus oftentimes called, they were fish, they were business people. Why? Because what are entrepreneurs doing? What do business people do? Solve a problem. That's what a business is. Any successful business is a, a business that solves a problem. This Apple is successful the way that they are successful. Amazon, let's just make, let's go Amazon. Amazon is successful because it solves problems. And watch this. And when the pandemic hit, whoo, they geared that thing up. And now Jeff is flying to the moon, baby. Come on, he's flying out of space. He's on a whole nother level. Why? Because he understands the value of solving problems. Could this, a lot of, we talk about speaking in tongues. We talk about interpreting tongues. Okay. We, we talk about prophecy. We talk about the word of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, the healing. Right. We talk about all these things, but there's one gift we forgot. The gift to solve a problem. Are you tracking with me? Can we go further? Mm hmm. And so I believe as we are laying the foundation down for who we are going to be, and I've got weeks of conversation about this, as we are laying it down, the first thing that we have to recognize that we have been anointed to do by the Spirit of the Lord is to solve problems. Hallelujah. I, uh, my, my, my personal testimony, like no matter what challenging situation I'm in, no matter what challenging counseling situation I am walking into, I have an assurance within me that I am going to be effective at solving it. I swear to you, I have never been trained in counseling I have never been trained in psychology with the exception of just some basic courses you take in college. And I wrote a book called Wholeness that was released. Many of you read it in 2018. And therapists, licensed therapists use it in their practice. Use some of the principles from the book in their practice. I have never, ever, ever studied any of that but the spirit. <laughs> You got to know what you got. You got to know what you have. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, of knowledge. You got it. Mm. You're going to solve, you're going to problem solve your way into your next. Uh -huh. That's why businesses have influence. They gained their influence through solving a problem. They prospered, literally, because they solved problems. What does that mean? That means that people value problem solvers. Mm. People trust problem solvers. Watch this. People surrender to problem solvers. <laughs> and so what we're going to do is we're going to do good. We're going to problem solve so amazingly that people are going to say, what is that? And when they say, what is that? You know what we're going to say? We're going to say the kingdom. Mm, 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 mm. And, so, and so a modern church, I'm almost done. God's good. <laughs> a modern church is a moving church. A modern church is a moving church. And it's moving in that it is both on the move, advancing the kingdom. Notice it says, and the Lord, how the Lord anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power, watch this, who went about doing good. Now, let me tell you what the puddle mentality says. The puddle mentality doesn't say went or go, the puddle mentality says, come. <laughs> come on. Come on. I'm over here, 614 North La Brea Avenue. 
Come. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. That's great. That's great. But Jesus' strategy was go. <laughs> oh, y'all not ready. What if, watch this, what if we became a puddle when God always wanted us to be a river? And listen, a puddle, it's still water. You can still get a little wet in a puddle, you know what I mean? You can dance, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you can even get down there and drink a little bit for a little while. But if I was God and I called you to be a river and you settled into a puddle, I would shake that puddle up to get you to the place where you remember who you are. He said, out of your belly, out of you, not in, out. In is for beginners. Because I can't pull out of you if I don't put in you first, right? I, I got you. I give you that. I give you that. Okay? When you first become a believer, I got to, you know, so you get to play in the puddle. But everybody can't play in the puddle. We got to get in the river. So the modern church is a moving church that's moving in that it's, it's, it's both on the move, advancing the kingdom, but watch this. It's also moving in that it is adjusting as the spirit leads us and watch this, how the world produces need. Oh, I got to say that right. As the world produces need, what do we need from the world? Problems. See, we run from problems. Oh my God, the world's going down the handbag. Oh my God, I can't believe. It. Oh Jesus, Lord, I can't. Just take me now, Jesus. Oh, because it's just too crazy. They doing this. No, 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 no. Watch this. The kingdom thrives off of problems. We're running from problems, and God says, I have anointed you to run to the problem. Oh, I feel the Lord. And what happens when the church, by supernatural endowment, ooh, begins to solve problems that billionaires can't solve, that governments can't solve, that, that celebrities can't solve. What happens when the church now, because she is organized and she will, refuses to be a puddle and says, I'm a river and I got something. When God saved me, he didn't just save me, but he filled me with something. And I've got a treasure chest on the inside of me. I've got wisdom for that. I've got knowledge for that. I've got a revelation for that. I've got a breakthrough for that. I've got something for that. David, in Lada Shah, David conquered Goliath with, watch this, one stone, but he had five. In other words, bring your brother, bring your cousin. I don't care. Bring this problem, bring that problem. I've got five smooth stones. I've got the grace of God in my bag. You run up on me, I'm gonna put it right between your eyes. Whatever giant you are, whatever giant you are, you got a bag full of stones. I feel the Holy Ghost. You got a bag full of stones. You got a bag full of stones, wisdom, revelation, counsel, understanding, might, that might be five. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is something else. That's your five smooth stones. Let's count them off again. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, 
knowledge. That's what you got. That's five. That's the number of grace. He gave some to be apostles. He gave some to be prophets. He gave some to be evangelists. He gave some to be pastors and teachers. That's five for grace. I can get it done by grace. So what problem have you been anointed to solve in your shepherd's bag? Come on, Davids. Come on, Davida. Come on, I see you. I see you. I see you, David. I see you, Davida. Hallelujah. And you know what David had? He had this thing called the key of David. And you know what it says about the key of David? God says, I'll give you the key of David and I'll open doors that no man can shut. And I'll shut doors that no man, I feel God. I will open doors that no man can shut and I will shut doors that no man can open. What is the promise? I will do through you what man cannot do. You are a problem solver. Put it in the feet right now. Say, I'm a problem solver. I'm a problem solver. That's what we do, baby. And one day LA proved it. All you gotta do is get on one accord. All you gotta do is not make it about church and, and not make it about buildings and, and not make it about how many you're running. How many you're running, Doc? You're running a thousand this week, a five thousand. Who cares? How many devils are you running? How many problems are you running out of your city? Are you running out of I feel God? There is a new day coming to the church. This is Bible. How God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. We think that and we think, okay, yes, he ran out and cast out devils. Not first. Who went out solving problems. And then healing. Because his ability to solve the problems that the world couldn't solve gave him the platform into culture, into the hearts of man, to bring the fullness of the gospel expression. And that's who we're going to be, family. That's who we're going to be. The shift, one of the shifts, we're going to talk about this for four more weeks, but one of the shifts that's taking place in our movement, and it's a glorious, you'll hear more and more about it, is the emphasis that we are putting on philanthropy. We're putting that right up front. We're not going to be a a pulpit centered or a pulpit focused church. We're going to be a problem solving focused church. And I believe that as we put that out front and we're already doing it, I thank God for our movement. We're already touching and changing and reaching so many lives all around the world. From LA to Uganda, it's already happening, but we're about to turn it up with intentionality as we see this as a fundamental part of our identity. You'll hear more about it. I'm gonna be raising up leaders and multiplying us. A man or woman is not marked by how many fans or followers they have. A man or woman is marked by how many great men and women are raised up under them. Oh God, I feel it. How many big people you raise up under you. That's the mark of greatness. So if I have a church or a community of 50 people, but out of the 50, I raise up 49 leaders. I am more influential than the person that has 10,000 people and only has two or three leaders raised up. That's dysfunction. This is the new model. This is modern, but yet retro. And we're going to talk more about it next week. But I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. If you say, PT, man, there's a fire burning in me. I feel like the Holy Spirit is stirring me. It's, it's shaking something, stirring something up in me. I feel like I got a key. Ooh, da, da, da. I feel like I got a key today. I feel like my calling just got a little more clear. 
and I feel faith for it. <laughs> I feel faith for it. I feel like I got revelation and I feel like I got faith and, and I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. This is no hocus pocus. I didn't pull this out of some old trick bag book. Straight out the scripture and not just anyone. This is Jesus. The, the, the quintessential mark for us as it relates to who we are as ministers. And it's right there in that simple thing, anointed to solve problems. If you're committed, you say, PT, I receive that. I want to be, I don't want to be a puddle believer. I want to be a river. See, here's another thing. In a puddle, the gifts can't even come out in a puddle. <laughs> They can't even come out in a puddle. It's not big enough. I feel that. But in a river, I feel God. Some of you, your calling was wait, waiting for this shift in the church. The full rashirara. And watch this, I'm gonna be honest with you. And you were entangled by things because you haven't been able to exercise the power of what's in you because you've been in a puddle situation. And as you get into the river, you're going to realize that you had gills. You didn't even know that you had gills. You didn't even know you could breathe on the water. You, you didn't even know that you were created, that you have fins and various things. You didn't even know because there was no context for you to use them. Last thing I'm going to say, we got to go. You know how I got started into ministry? I just had, I, was, I grew up in the inner city and I knew the struggles of the inner city and my aunt worked for the juvenile justice system. And I just wanted to, I knew that I could help them. So I went there one day with my notes to speak to young men in, in East LA or wherever it was, I think it was in Downey, one of the young correctional facilities. I went in there with my notes and everything. And I'm like, I'm gonna help these guys. Like, and I went in there and I saw them and I tried to go off my notes and the spirit fell on me and I didn't even know much about the Holy Ghost like that at all I'm trying to help I was still in business and I'm just trying to be you know just an encouraging voice to these young men but when I got in front of them and I saw them something just just rose up and I couldn't do my notes and now I reckon it was the Holy Ghost and I'm just solving problems solving problems solving problems solving problems and that's how I discovered my anointing I just went to solve a problem. So what I'm getting at is that there's some of you, and now that you have this problem-solving mentality, and I believe that faith is arising in you, and you recognize and believe that faith is, you heard something, right? The Lord spoke to you. And the reason why you have faith for it is because faith is the byproduct of you receiving a word that's connecting with an identity that God has placed on the inside of you. There's a connection you heard something out of you that connected with something in you and it produced faith for it because it's true. And as you do it, you're going five, you're going to find your five graces. Man, somebody's life is getting ready to change. If you submit to this word right now, if you hear it and you step into it and you commit to doing good, to solving problems, I promise you, I promise you, you're never gonna lack. You're never gonna lack any good thing. You're never gonna lack wisdom. You're never gonna lack resources. You're never gonna lack team. All of what you need to accomplish it, you're not gonna lack a thing. And so if that's you, when you say, PT, that's me, that's me. I'm gonna be a problem solver. Put it right there in the feed. Tell somebody, write this down. Don't, don't hear messages like this and not repeat them or write them. These are moments. And these are moments that make you. And you have to document it. Tell somebody. There's accountability when you share with somebody and say, hey, this is what I heard. And, and, and you have to write it when you hear it because that's when it's the clearest because the enemy comes immediately and he tries to uproot it because this thing will make hell nervous. And the enemy knows it. That's why the enemy be trying to solve problems. To gain platform. Nah. And he ain't got power like us. I also want to extend this invitation to you. If you're watching me, if you're 
listening to me right now and you have never opened up your heart to God fully. Maybe you have a respect for God and that's amazing, right? That's a phenomenal start. The word says that the fear or the reverence of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's a great start. But you haven't quite figured out the significance of Jesus. Let me just make it plain for you really quickly. Here, here it is. What the scriptures say about Jesus is this. It said, he, the scriptures say that God made him who had no sin. What is sin? Sin is limitation. Sin has to do with the limitation. It's a weakness. It means to miss the mark. Literally, that Greek word that was translated, sin means to miss the mark. It's to come up short. It's to have a limitation. You were created in the image of God, which means that you were not created to have limits. You were created in God's image. And God is infinite. You were created to live forever, the whole get down. And so when it says that God made him Jesus who had no sin, no limit, no, when he, he, he says he made Jesus who had no sin to become sin so that we can become the righteousness of God in him. What does that mean? So that means that when you think about Jesus, think about the son of God taking upon himself your limitation, your weakness, your struggle, Whatever it is about you that makes you less divine, he took upon himself, became it, and then put it to death in his body on the cross for you. And then when he was raised free and victorious from those things and ultimately ascended to heaven and then now is making intercession, is encouraging you, advocating you, sent the Holy Spirit to empower you to begin to walk in a divine nature. That's what he did. That's the gospel. So accepting Jesus, watch this, is simply coming into a, a agreement with the gift that God has bestowed upon all of us so that we can begin to live in the restoration of that gift from level to level. You don't have to be stuck in anything. He took your pain. He took your brokenness. He took your shame. He took your sickness. He took your insecurities. He took everything negative about you and put it on himself, put it to death, buried it, put it in hell where it deserved, where it belonged, was raised up on the third day and says, if you come and live in me, watch this, you and I together, by the power of my Holy Spirit, we're going to walk out of your limitation. Oh God, I feel it. And you're going to go from level to level and glory to glory, and step by step, I'm going to walk you, watch this, out of your mortality and into your immortality from level to level. And ultimately, when you completely shed what is not you, then that, and I'm talking about your spirit, which is you, is going to be completely free. You're literally walking into freedom. And so although your outer person is perishing. Your inner person, who you truly are, is being renewed day by day. That's the journey, baby. We get better as we get older. Isn't that amazing? Better than the finest wine. In the Lord, we get better as we get older because the longer we live, the more our inside is renewed. We think better. No, we don't get old and bitter. We get old and better. We're closer to the Lord. We've been walking with the Lord. We've shed off some things. God has worked this thing out. He worked this thing out last year. He worked this thing out this year. Next year, he's working out this thing. And next thing you know, you're going to not have things to work out. Just, to, just hardly anything to work out. And then you're going to be gone, but not gone. So if you're here and you've never opened up your heart to the Lord and you say, I want that life, PT., is simple. It is simple. The only way that you can even perceive this level, this depth of invitation is if the Lord himself is touching you. I can't speak to your soul. I can't do that. I can put words out there, but actually knocking on the door of your heart, the door of your soul, I can't do that. But God can through my words or through what you hear. It might not be my words. It's what he causes you to hear can bring you into a moment where you say, I feel, I feel like there's something there. I'm at a crossroads. I feel it. And all you've got to do is just say, yes, I surrender. If that's you, I, 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 I just want you to say yes. Just say yes. If that's you, just say yes. 
just say yes. If you want to take it further, say, I receive. I receive. I receive. I receive. I receive. You want to take it even further? Say, I receive you, Jesus. I receive you, Jesus. I receive you. God bless you. There are instructions there. Our staff is there ready to pray for you. Let us know you made this decision. God is with you. It's amazing. And guess what he's going to do? He's going to anoint you with the Holy Spirit and with power. And you're going to go and do good <laughs> and solve problems. And you're going to heal all who are oppressed. I love you. Thank you for allowing me this time with you. Watch this. Listen to this again. There was a lot of things that God said and spoke to you, and I believe it's right up his alley concerning your life. Next week, we're taking it further in this series called The Modern Church New Dimension. I'm excited about what God is showing me, and I'm going to bring it to you, and I believe that your life and the life of this movement and, and believers everywhere will never be the same. I love you. God bless you.